waiting for your ways. I'm waiting for the day when I am a soul on fire. Till I am a soul on fire. Kilpatrick Church. As always, I hope you feel like I do, that when you get here, you are uh, with family. And I hope you always understand, you are Kilpatrick Church. If you guys don't show up, I don't get to stand up here and say to the building, good morning, Kilpatrick Church, because the building wouldn't care. I could say it, but the building would not care. So thank you for being Kilpatrick Church. Uh, it, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So I'm here as always just to welcome you, as I've already done, to talk about the bulletin a little bit. Uh, bulletin has a tear-off, serves two purposes. We'll talk about the prayer side first. We'll shake things up a little bit. Uh, prayer side is prayer requests. If you fill out the prayer request side of that and put them in the, uh, you can put them in the wooden tithing boxes on your way out, or you can take them to the welcome center. Those are prayer requests that are prayed for by staff uh, year wrong, long. And, or, oh, no goodness, sorry, I saw a puppy dog and I, my mind went somewhere. Those are prayer requests that the staff prays for during the week, and uh, Rocky sends them out to all the staff, and we pray for them individually, and then again, when we get together on Wednesdays for our staff meeting. Uh, if you have a prayer request that you would like to go out to the whole wide church, that's awesome. You just need to make sure you get it to the church office and put in there, uh, specifically, please, church-wide 
prayer requests so uh, we know exactly what you'd like. On the other side of the tear-off is our uh, information part where you can give, up, give us information so that you are on that mailing list for, for church-wide emails or for any of the other things. If you're interested in any of those things, if you've been coming forever but all of a sudden you're like, hey, there's a child in our life that needs to be dedicated, just write your name, your email address, uh, Whatever it is, if you're a first time, second time, third time guest, or you've never given us any of your information, please, pretty please, you can fill all that out that you want to, take it to our welcome center, uh, the, the person who's at the welcome center will give you a nice little gift, and then we'll make sure we get you on all the things, and as I've said before, we haven't figured out yet how to sell that information to make any money, so we don't sell your email address or anything, just so you know, I'm being honest. Uh, Honesty is always the best policy, right? Thank you. All right. Um, okay, in our bulletin, that's not the only things in the bulletin. Bulletin is packed full of all kinds of information. We want you to know a few things I'm going to highlight. We have a shoebox work day uh, coming up this week, next Saturday. Shoebox work day. I believe I saw stuff out on the Welcome Center that would have things that maybe are needed. Uh, you can talk to Penny if you if you have any more information on the work day. Uh, trunk or treat is coming up. Man, is that already this? It is this this Saturday. Trunk or treat's coming up. Uh, so we are still looking for some. I mean, you can bring you can bring candy all week long. But today, before you leave, if you'd go out there and just look and see if you want to sign up for anything, we we'd love a couple more trunks. I think we've got a dozen. So that's awesome. But if uh, if you just haven't signed up for the trunk yet, and you're like, oh, I'm planning on having a trunk here, then please sign up. Let them know. And then the only other thing, it's it's a little bit later, but the walk. Uh, if you have not signed up for the walk, you don't have to sign up to come. I know Pastor Vic pretty well, and he's not going to kick anybody out. Like he's not going to be checking a list saying, nope, you didn't sign up. But I also know. They would love for you to actually have a name down so they can kind of coordinate food, drinks, all that stuff, prizes, um, everything else. So if you really know, like, I'm going to go to the walk or I'm pretty sure I'm going to the walk conference, please sign up for them just so they have a little more peace of mind. I think there's only like three people signed up right now, so it's hurting their feelings. That's probably what it is. I'm just kidding. There's lots of people signed up. But sign up if you... Uh, if you haven't. All right. Let me finish chewing. And then we'll pray. All right. Pray with me this morning. Father God, uh, thank you for a place, a building uh, that we sometimes call Kilpatrick Church. Uh, but thank you for this place that we can get together as the church and uh, worship and praise you and uh, just live life together. Uh, Lord, not just Sunday mornings, but other days of the week. Lord, I pray, that, uh, I pray that we all understand. You know exactly what we're bringing in here. Uh, you know what has happened this week. You know what makes us worried. You know what brings us anxiety. Lord, none of those things caught you by surprise. None of those, th those things were new to you. Uh, you have known about them for forever. And, and Lord, I pray that we, we understand and we try our best to live out the fact that we can give those to you. We can lay them down at your feet. They're already yours. But we can say, Lord, there's nothing I can do. So I'm going to give those to you and trust you with them. And then just, Lord, let me do my part and give you glory no matter the outcome of those things. So, Lord, help us to lay those things down at your feet and not pick them up again. Lord, help us to do that so we can worship this morning. We can sing songs uh, uh, to you of adoration and praise because you are worthy, Lord. So help us and, and hear us. We know you hear our voices, Lord. We pray that, uh, that you are happy when you hear uh, us singing these songs of, of adoration to you, Lord. And then as we worship you today later uh, through the word that Pastor Rocky is going to bring us, Lord, open our hearts, open our minds uh, to hear what it is that you have prepared uh, all week long for us, for each one of us, Lord. Not, not so that we can just gain information and gain knowledge and be able to tell somebody, somebody else uh, something about your book, Lord, but know that so that we change, so that we gain that knowledge and understand how you want us to look more and more like your son so we can shine bright in an ever-darkening world, Lord. Hear our prayers this morning. We thank you for, for everything you give us and everything you do not. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
All right, you can stand and join the worship team this morning. Greatest day in history. Death is beating, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. empty grave life eternal you have won the day shout it out jesus is alive he's alive and oh happy day happy day you wash my sin away oh happy day happy
Father, we bow our hearts before you this morning, grateful for the privilege of approaching your throne, remembering that happy day when you washed our sins away, when you cleansed us, when you forgave us. You brought us into your family. as we journey along in life you teach us as we've just sung teach us to abide Father it's sometimes difficult in life to be still and to just abide your word tells us that if we draw close to you that you will draw close to us Teach us how to do that. We want to know you better. We want to love you more deeply. We do want to abide. Lord, you know what we have faced this week. There are those who have faced some traumatic moments. Teach them to abide. There are those who are dealing with some serious physical struggles teach them to abide there are those who have decisions that need to be made that could be life impacting teach them to abide God thank you that you are trustworthy we can rest assured that as we follow your commands walking in obedience to you, that you will lead us down paths of righteousness. You won't ever lead us astray. Thank you. This morning, every one of us needs your touch. For some, it may be physical, others emotional, and still others spiritual. Would you meet our needs? exactly as you see fit. Lord, as we share your word this morning, I'm asking for your help to share your word accurately, clearly. And I'm asking that the ears of the hearers would be open, that there would be no barriers, but that you would speak directly to each one of us. Apply your truth exactly as it needs to be applied in our lives. At the end of this day, whatever you choose to do, whatever change you choose to bring, we say thank you. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it is good to be here this morning. Trust that you are here with, I had an old pastor just say that your cup is right side up, so the Lord can fill it up. If it's upside down, um, probably not going to get filled. So uh, your Bibles are open to Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. I've entitled them today's message, Bloody Hands. I don't have a good British accent to say bloody, but it'd be kind of nice. This is week three in our Perfect Hatred series. And so far, what we have seen is that God hates haughty eyes, that is, pride. We've also discovered last week that God hates a lying tongue. And that is a person who does not have integrity, a person who doesn't speak the truth nor live according to the truth. And Scripture says God hates that. Our focus this morning is going to be on the third thing God hates, and that is hands that shed innocent blood. Would you agree with me that words have meaning? Words mean things, right? Uh, when I began studying this particular uh, phrase of thing, one of the things that God hates, there were four words that stood out to me. These four words are hands shed innocent, and blood. 
Let's think about each of those just real quickly. We know what hands are. Hands are tools. We've been given hands to do a lot of things. Hands have giftings. Hands touch. Hands correct. Do you ever have a hand correct you? My dad knew how to do that. Hands caress. Hands build. Hands draw. Hands shape and form. They're artistic. Hands cook and hands bake. Our, our hands can be used for, for a variety of wonderful, loving, and productive things. But hands are also capable of doing things which are devious, wicked, criminal. And in this particular scripture this morning, the focus is on hands which are not doing good things. The next word that stood out to me was the word shed. And we know what shed means, and in this particular context, it means to, to pour out, to cause to flow, to spill. And the picture of the word shed here is that of an individual causing something to be poured out or spilled. And then we come to the word innocent. And innocent means to be free from blame or guilt. We look at the newborn baby, and there's an innocence there which we recognize, isn't there? At that particular moment, they haven't done anything wrong. They're free from blame or guilt, at least from the perspective of personal sin. But we also think of innocence from a legal perspective, don't we? An individual who's been accused of something or charged with something, and then they've been cleared because there was no evidence of wrongdoing that was found. They are free from blame. They are innocent. So we understand innocence. And then blood, that flowing red liquid within our veins, which carries oxygen and, and is crucial for life. So, so we understand these words. Words mean things. And then when we put it all together, it helps us grasp what the Proverbs writer is talking about. So listen to what the writer says in Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19, and we're going to focus in on the third thing God hates. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a man who stirs up dissension among brothers. Understanding these words, the four that I have mentioned, let's hear them in the expanded format, okay? The Lord is unable and unwilling to put up with and has a feeling of open hostility and intense dislike towards individuals who use their hands to cause the lifeblood of a person who was free from blame and guilt to be poured out. And that's the expanded, using the definition of hate and then expanding on each of those words. Every week we've been asking this question about the things that God hates. Why does God hate hands that shed innocent blood? If I were to ask you that question probably your immediate answer would be, well, because it's wrong to kill. And it is wrong to kill, right? But why is it wrong to kill? Why do we say that it's wrong? Why is our first response probably going to be, well, it's wrong to kill? I'm suggesting to us that God has placed within each of us a moral compass our conscience, perhaps, which reveals to us that there is something wrong with the taking of the life of another individual. But I think for us to really have the best understanding, let's go back to the origin of life and talk about life itself. Where did life come from? Who gave it? 
And once we discover who the giver of life is, does the giver of life have instructions for us concerning life? Once we can grasp that, then we can come up with a biblical answer as to why God hates hands that shed innocent blood. Let's begin here with the question, why did, or where did life come from? I would suggest to us this morning, based upon the scripture, that God is the giver of life. In order to understand that, we, we need to go all the way back to the beginning. I've put some scripture up on the screen, some scripture references. Genesis 1, here's how his word begins. In the beginning, God. He was there. He was there before time as we know it began. He existed. He has existed for eternity past. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And as we read on in chapter 1, we, dis we see that in six days, God spoke this universe and our world into existence. It's on day six that the masterpiece of his creation came into existence. What is his masterpiece? Mankind. Human beings Let's see what happens. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Why do we say that mankind is the masterpiece? No other creation is made in the image of God. You and I are made in the image of God, and that makes us special, unique from all other creation. When we get to Genesis chapter 2, the creation of human beings is kind of fleshed out a little bit more. What we learn is that God takes dust from the ground, and he, he forms the body of man. And then scripture says, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And we can't miss what is said next. And man became a living being. We dare not overlook that fact. It wasn't until God breathed the breath of life into the man that man became a living being. Who's the giver of life? God is the giver of life. He initiated life. Life was his idea. He's the only one who can give life. You and I are incapable of bringing anything to life. We've not been given that ability by the giver of life. If we jump to Acts chapter 17, verses 24 and 25, Paul affirms again that God is the giver of life. He is on Mars Hill. He's in Athens. He's debating with some smart guys. And he says to them, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Because he himself, notice this, he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. Folks, our life, our breath, and everything we have comes from the giver of life. God is the giver of life. We're trying to answer the question, why would God hate hands that shed innocent blood? Not only is God the giver of life, but he is the sustainer of life. We read in Colossians 1, 15, and it's speaking of Jesus, who is God in the flesh. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. Note this. He is before all things. In other words, he existed before all. Jesus has always existed, the second person of the Trinity. And in him all things hold together. Jesus God in the flesh is the sustainer of life. So he's the giver of life, he's the sustainer of life, but he's also the taker of life. 
In Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve had sinned in the garden, God comes to speak with them and pronounces the curse because of sin. It's in those moments that he pronounced that death would be the end of our human life. He said to Adam, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. This is where the reality of human death is first brought into man's understanding. God gives life. He sustains life. He takes life. As we read further in Scripture, we understand that God has set limits on the life expectancy of humans. Prior to the flood, we see people living a long, long time. And then as sin increased, we find in Genesis 6 that God seems to have set a basic limit on the lifespan of people of around 120 years. There's a couple of different thoughts. Some people say he's saying in 120 years, I'm going to destroy the earth by flood. Others say he's setting a limit of time of people living. Following the flood, the life expectancy of people, the lifespan became noticeably shorter. Many years later, Moses writes in the Psalms, and he says this, the length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow for they quickly pass and we fly away. God has set limits on this earthly life. Hebrews 9.27, you might write that down, confirms each of us is destined to what? Die. We ain't getting out of here alive, folks, unless the rapture takes place first. You, might like, you must like the rapture part, huh? You know, um, but we're all going to die. Be encouraged by that. Now understand, all of this is put in place by who? God. He's the giver of life. He's the sustainer of life. And he is the taker. Of life. Again, we're trying to answer the question why would God hate hands that shed innocent blood? Well, as the giver of life, let's look at God's view of human life. He has the right to make the rules governing human life is he, if he's the giver, right? A study of Scripture reveals that no one is to personally take the life of another human being. That's called murder. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 5, this is following the flood. God is speaking to Noah and his sons, and he says this, And for your lifeblood I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal. And from each man, too, I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man. What do we understand from this? God views life as something valuable. He gave it. It's a gift. And he views it as so valuable that anyone who takes the life of another will give an account to God for that action. Sometime later, God gives the Ten Commandments to the people of Israel. And he gives them a very simple statement. You shall not murder. Pretty clear. Don't do it, right? Folks, I, I want to make sure that we're tracking here. God views human life as valuable. And it is not the right of one person to take the life of another. We as believers, this is not a political statement, we as followers of Jesus Christ must be pro-life. That's biblical, not political. Now, understanding how God views life as valuable and not the right of one person to take the life of another, 
almost ironically, we find that God approves of some types of taking of life. Did you know that? Both Old and New Testaments talk about capital punishment or the death penalty. In fact, in, in the law of Moses, and I've just given some general references, the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, as well as Romans 13. In, in the Old Testament, in the law of Moses, the death penalty is, just, is prescribed for several actions. For murder. For kidnapping. For adultery. For homosexuality. For rape. For prostitution. As well as other crimes. Now, now, this capital punishment is not one individual taking things into his or her own hands and taking the life of another. This is not a personal vendetta. Capital punishment in the scripture under God's direction is carried out under the context of community and in a judicial governmental type system. Paul writes about the place of government in Romans 13. And he says this, that God's servants are agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Again, it's a judicial act, not a personal vengeance of one person to the next. So here's your blanks. Capital punishment is a judicial act, not a personal vengeance. Vendetta. There's another kind of death that isn't directly addressed, but we can look at Scripture and gain an understanding, and that is wartime <coughs> death. Is the killing in wartime considered murder? Does God disapprove of that? Well, we know that God instructed the people of Israel as they conquered the land of Canaan to take the life of those living in the land. Conquer them. This would be wartime death. Why would he do that? Because when we look at it, he says, kill the, kill, the, kill the men, kill the women, kill the children. Do away with them. It sounds like, ah, brutal. But folks, we must understand that these deaths, as they conquer the land, was part of God's judgment on the people for their decades and centuries long rebellion against him and rejection of him. And while there are minimal instructions, virtually no instructions about it, it appears that God does not frown on wartime death. And you say, why would you say that? Well, God would not instruct his people to do something that was contrary to his character and to his will. How do we correlate all that together? Don't murder, and yet there are a handful of things of, of death that God says that's approved by me. Well, let me summarize that. God is the giver of life, the sustainer of life, the taker of life, and he has every right to make the rules governing life whether we fully understand or whether we agree with his plan or not. It's what the word teaches. Now, that's kind of a long introduction to get to our passage, isn't it? God basically states innocent life is not to be taken. God hates hands that shed innocent blood. A review of the Old Testament records many instances of innocent blood being shed. And we find that it is detestable. It's an abomination to God. First of all, we come to some scripture that I just want to refer you to. In Psalm 106, this is a, a summary psalm of the history of Israel including their turning away from worshiping and serving God. In verses 36 through 38, we read these words. They, the people of Israel, worshiped their idols, which became a snare to them. 
They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons. They shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters who they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was desecrated by their blood. A summary statement of what was going on, the shedding of innocent blood. We also find specific instances with names. In 2 Kings chapter 16, Ahaz was a king of Judah. And in 2 Kings 16, it reveals to us that he sacrificed his son in the fire. He offered his son to a pagan god as a sacrifice. That's the shedding of innocent blood. If we go to the next chapter, 2 Kings 17, it reveals to us that the people of Israel forsook all the commands of God and worshiped Baal or Baal, sacrificing their sons and daughters in the fire. King Manasseh, 2 Kings 21, did the same thing, sacrificing his own son in the fire, and this provoked God to anger. Ezekiel reveals God's anger at the people in Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. Why? Because they took their sons and their daughters and they sacrificed them as food to the idols. All of this was in direct violation of God's command to Israel in Leviticus 18.20. Listen to what he says, Leviticus 18.20. Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Moloch, that was a pagan god. For you must not profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. The shedding of innocent blood. So now back to the question, why would God hate hands that shed innocent blood? Because he's the giver of life. And he's given instructions about life and about the taking of life. He's commanded there is to be no murder. There's to be no taking of innocent life. And for anyone to violate his commands is sin. And God hates sin. Now, let's get specific. The shedding of innocent blood. Probably the first thought which comes to mind when we hear hands that shed innocent blood is murder. Murder is the premeditated taking of the life of another or the taking of the life of another in a heat of passion, not necessarily premeditated. We could probably put in this category as well what is often called negligent homicide. Not all, but for example, you're driving under the influence of drugs or alcohol and you cause the death of another. That is the shedding of innocent blood. Murder is one of the biggies, right? Probably comes to mind. But perhaps this comes to mind. Abortion. Abortion falls into this category of hands that shed innocent blood. Science would tell us this, and the scripture would point to this, that the DNA is set at the moment of conception. Gender, hair color, height, etc. It's all there. In Psalm 139, 13 through 16, David says, For you, God, created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Abortion is the shedding of innocent blood. We could probably include euthanasia in this category. That is assisted suicide by a medical professional. It's the taking of life. It's the shedding of innocent blood. And though it may sound hard, God hates hands that shed Innocent blood. It's probably more fun to focus on those biggies. But I want us to zoom in. Because 
probably none of you have ever committed murder. You're probably not looking to assisted suicide or whatever. Could be that there have been moments where abortion has been a part of your life. And folks, understand this. If that's been the case, that's not an unpardonable sin. God loves life. And he loves you, even if you may have made a choice that would not have been right. So nobody leave this place today if that has been something in, you've dealt with in your life. Don't leave defeated here. Okay? Okay. I want us to just kind of move in because none of us were probably going to go for the biggies. I want to suggest to us that hands that shed innocent blood is not limited to the physical taking of the life of another, causing them to no longer live. And there's a reason I say that. In the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5 of Matthew, verses 21 and 22, Jesus is talking about murder. And he says, you have heard that it was said to the people of long ago, do not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Now, what is Jesus teaching here? He is teaching that there is a very close connection between the act of murder and the anger that is behind murder. And it appears that he is saying that the act of murder as well as the anger of a, towards a brother receives the same punishment or judgment. I believe it's accurate to say that anger is the primary sentiment behind murder. One commentary says, Jesus says that the commandment extends to emotional murder, to a sense of resentment and anger against someone, Such anger is itself a violation on man made in the image of God. So could it be, could it be that hands that shed innocent blood extends beyond the physical taking of life to the robbing of life in other ways? I'm going to suggest two of them, and no doubt there are more. Our words may take the life of another person's reputation. That's shedding innocent blood. Hurtful, slanderous, and dishonest words bring ruin. And this happens in many arenas of life. The political arena, the entertainment industry, business, etc., And what I know is that accusations, whether true or false, tend to stick and tarnish. As I was reflecting on this, I can think of at least two Supreme Court candidates over the last 35 years who had accusations tossed at them of sexual harassment or sexual misconduct. Now, only they and their accusers know whether or not this happened. But the result of these accusations tarnished these two in the eyes of the public. Their their reputation was tarnished, was killed. And probably the accusations will be the asterisk beside their name throughout history. Words can shed innocent blood. And so you and I need to be careful what we say about others. I mentioned this particular topic, I believe last week or at some point, human trafficking, hands that shed innocent blood, goes directly to this. Whether it be men, women, or children, Those who are being trafficked are having their lives taken from them, their identity taken from them. They're being broken and used and abused and tossed away. Human trafficking, sex trafficking industry is destroying the lives 
of many. Just a couple facts. Did you know that the U.S. accounts for almost 52% of global human trafficking, with the sex trafficking of minors accounting for the largest percentage? It's happening in Michigan, folks. This isn't something that happens in California or New York City. It happens here. Traffickers make over $9.5 billion annually in the U.S. alone. Over one million children are trafficked for the sex trade every year. Those who are doing this, shedding innocent blood, are making great financial profits from their exploitation. Not only are they guilty of shedding innocent blood, but those who are violating, participating, they are shedding innocent blood. What does God say? He hates hands which shed innocent blood. May God help us. Because we're not going to do the biggies. May God help us especially in this area of our speech, of reputation, to be really, really cautious that our words are not taking the life of someone else. How can we avoid hands that shed innocent blood? How can we avoid that being true about us? Let me suggest three ways and we close. Number one, Guard your emotions. Guard your emotions, especially your anger. Now, anger in itself is not sin. There are some things we ought to be angry about. The abuse and the mistreatment of others should cause something, a righteous anger to rise up within us. The anger that we must guard against is this selfish anger which arises because we didn't get our way or somebody did us wrong and we desire vengeance. Guard your emotions because that anger can turn into hatred, which can turn into the taking of innocent life, whether by reputation or actual taking of life. Secondly, guard your words. So guard your emotions. Guard your words. You know the tongue can get you into trouble. You ever had your tongue get you in trouble? One of the ways our tongue gets us in trouble is assumptions. How many times have you assumed something and even then made a statement based upon your assumption and then found out you were wrong? James has something to say about our, our tongue. Listen to James 3, 6. Not very flattering, okay? The tongue also is a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. That's nice. He goes on to say in verse 8, No man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So if we want to avoid being hands that shed innocent blood, guard your words. Be careful what you say. Listen carefully. Be certain of what you say when you say it. You remember, um, well, some of you won't remember it. Hee-haw. Remember that little statement about gossip? Better listen close the first time because we don't gossip, you know? Uh, no. Be certain of what you say when you say it. Don't spread damaging information about others. You may know some things, but you don't have to say everything you know. That's a good amen spot right there. Our words can kill people and the reputation. 
And finally, do the exact opposite of shedding innocent blood. Be kind and compassionate. Paul gives us clear and simple instructions in Ephesians 4.32. Listen, verse 5 as well. Uh, that's not right. Verse 32, Ephesians 4.32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Then in chapter 5, he says, be imitators of God as dearly loved children. Live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Let me tell you, if you are kind, if you are forgiving, if you are compassionate, and if you're imitating God, you're not going to be shedding innocent blood. You're going to be careful how you live. Because remember, God is unable and unwilling to put up with and has a feeling of open hostility and intense dislike toward hands which shed innocent blood. Let's pray. Father, don't really know how to close this message with prayer. Except to ask you to help us to be very careful that we are not harming others by our words or our actions. Help us to guard our emotions and our words. And may there be an, inten an intentional living opposite of hands that shed innocent blood where we're kind, compassionate, forgiving, and we're imitating you. Lord, I'm just, it seems like I'm just kind of convicted or focused on this idea of, of our words. And wherever that needs to be applied to my life or our lives, stamp it hard upon us. May we be men and women who are careful that we are not malicious that we're not harming any others in any way by the things we say. Lord, please take this truth and let it fit us right where we're living. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you today. Thanks for being here. Go live out your faith.